You're watching GearWire.com. I'm Owen O'Malley, and we are at the 127th AES conference in New York, and I'm here with John Storick. How are you? Thank you. Thanks for being here. I'm the Storick of Walters Storick Design Group. I'm not Walter. I'm John. Walters is my wife and partner, Beth Walters, who would normally be here. But being infinitely more intelligent than me, she actually elected to go to parent day for our youngest son at college. Somebody had to go do the family business, and so that's where she is. It's the first AES she's ever missed. WSDG, which was an extension of my career, celebrating its 40th year. It's really now 41 years, going back to 1969, more or less continuously designing um, technology environments. Recording studios is clearly where we've uh, excelled in a quantity level anyway, and then uh, broadcast facilities, radio stations, small concert halls, home theaters, and now clubs, industrial acoustics, etc. But uh, at, at a few thousand recording studios, which is the number of studios we've done, uh, we, we, can, we certainly would consider ourselves somewhat knowledgeable in that field. So our firm uh, currently has about 45 people. We have four major offices. We're a global company. We have offices in Buenos Aires, Basel, Switzerland, and uh, Belo Horizonte, Brazil, and representation in San Francisco. And now we're opening up a new office in Miami next week, actually. So we're global. We all work together. The leaders of the offices are all former students. They're all 20 years younger than me. So we have some good news. We're busy. We, uh, the times have not been so good, at least so I'm told. And we're not without our, you know, we're not without some financial struggles. But, but um, uh, anybody that thinks that there aren't a lot of studios or content creation environments being built is, is just simply wrong. It's just not true. It is true that there have been some famous closings, and it is true that larger studios, the likes of which we knew in the sort of golden era of studios, 70s, 80s, into the 90s, are few and far between, okay? That's true. But replacing it are hundreds and hundreds, thousands and thousands of smaller niche project studios slash budget studios slash prosumer studios slash amateur hobbyist <laughs> soon to become professional studio. And I could go on and on and on, except I can't kind of put it in one six word acronym. The studios are smaller. They got smaller because the equipment got smaller. They also got cheaper. Believe it or not, a world-class studio, by that I mean one that's fully isolated and has accurate acoustics with accurate content creation equipment, will actually cost less now in today's dollars than it did five years ago in five-year-old dollars, not comparative dollars, in absolute dollars. Only one other industry has ever done that. That's the computer industry. But this is no surprise since at the heart of most of the studios are computers. So everything getting cheaper. But also, the acoustics got cheaper, believe it or not, because now we have lots of companies, uh, or more companies, or some companies, introducing prefabricated acoustical treatments, and we have more accurate prediction tools and more accurate measurement tools, and we have a whole industry being smarter about acoustics. I'm being a little self-serving because that's what we do, although we're very involved in, in equipment, and we like equipment, and we have to know and understand it, particularly speakers and particularly processing equipment. We're you know, which, which waves plug-in you use is, right. of, is interesting. So you really have to do keep very abreast we of keep the... very abreast of monitors. Yeah. We're in love with monitors and we have to understand them because the monitor is the last moment where the system touches the room. So we are very knowledgeable about every monitor and every monitor company wants us to fall in love with their monitors and <laughs> you can imagine what that seduction process looks like. So we're very, very touchy about that. We're also pretty touchy about the control surfaces because they're big. They're the next biggest object. Actually, they're the biggest object in the room. So we really want to know a lot about them. Yeah. And we need to know how they relate to the room. Yeah. Okay, if it's an all digital system, the audio might live 20 feet away and there's a telephone line between them. So that's very interesting. On the other hand, if it's an analog console, then things are very different. So we need to understand that. What I don't have to understand is the exact nature of Waves Bundle number 1708. I, I, I don't really have to know that. Other people have to know that. Uh, buy Eddie Kramer's new Waves Bundle, because he's my dear friend. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea whether it works or not. I have to assume it does. <laughs>
okay? And I know there's a nice picture of Eddie on the cover. <laughs> it is a nice okay. picture. It's a great picture of Eddie. But, but when I say I don't have to understand it, I just, I, I, it's really not, for, it's not that important to me. Now, sidebar, I am actually, I am interested in how things sound. Yeah. But it doesn't really affect what our work. Okay. As a matter of fact, there's not a, plo there's not a plug -in, in the in the world that affects the physical reality right. Right. Of, our, of our room. Okay. But I am interested to know if you're recording in the box, because all of a sudden we may not even have a console. Now that is interesting. Actually, I find that extremely interesting. And we have several studios where there are no consoles. I mean, when I say no consoles, no control surfaces. The most famous advertising studio in Milan, Italy is one that comes to mind. Just simply doesn't have a control surface. It's just got a keyboard and a mouse, because that's all they needed for their job. So that's what I find fascinating. No longer is all this stuff being driven by what the manufacturers were more or less jamming down our throats. Now, and I use this term a number of times, the artist is in control, and the whole, unit, the whole process is infinitely more democratic. We're not being told what to do. We can pick and choose exactly what I want, and although I'm a little, not, a little partial about this subject, I believe that acoustics is going to float to the top. It's the one common thread in most of these environments. If you get that right, the equipment is fungible. This is not bad news, this is just news. You get the acoustics wrong, you're just going to be another person with a lot of equipment in an environment that's not quite accurate enough, and sooner or later, that will dis you will be distinguished from another facility by that. Everybody's got Pro Tools. Anybody can buy a Waves plug-in. Anybody can buy Atom monitors or KRK monitors or Genelec monitors. These are good monitor systems, okay? But if they're not in the right environment and the recording environment is not correct, then what's distinguishing your room? That is, in fact, is what is distinguishing your environment from another environment, along with the other amenities, creature comfort issues, right. service, etc. Is I that mean, part of your concern, too, like the sort of how... We're extremely yeah. concerned. We're architects. I'm an architect. I started as an architect, but I was also a musician. Since I was 11, I was a musician and an architect. I never changed and wavered, and a frustrated ball player. And all through college, I studied architecture and was in a band, was in a, was in a blues band. And, and upon graduating, actually thought that I would be a musician. And then a kind of quirky turn of events that, I don't know if it's that interesting at this moment, but uh, all of a sudden, one, in a very wild summer of 1968, one thing led to another, and the next thing you know, I'm... How can you say that's not interesting? Well, it wasn't. It was very interesting. <laughs> And the next thing you know, I was designing a club, and Jimi Hendrix goes to the club, and he hires me to do his club, and that club became a studio. And the next thing you know, I'm, I'm a kid designing a studio for Jimi Hendrix. So, uh, did you study problem. acoustics at all before doing that? Never was in a studio. Career advice: If you're going to do a project as your first project, make it a famous one. <laughs> okay. So you know, the next thing you know, I'm on the ground floor of an industry. I quit my job. I was making a lot of money in an architecture firm quit work for free for an acoustician in order to learn my trade. I was an intern at 23. Yeah. Gave up my job. I, my wife at the time, not my current wife, <laughs> uh, was working and made enough money and I kind of pushed my way through that project with Eddie and we pushed and shoved and learned and whatever and we, and we got it open. I mean, and there are parts of that studio that are still standing. It is the oldest working studio in New York. But we got some of it right. We got some of it wrong, but we got a lot of it right. But in the meantime, you know, I, I was sucking up knowledge like a sponge. I did go back to Columbia, did study acoustics, and, uh, you know, came out of that two-year process designing lots of other studios, uh, including a studio for Leon Russell one day, and I got to go to his home and hang, and one day, literally, I can remember this like it was yesterday. I know exactly where I was sitting. I'm listening to Leon play piano, and literally at that moment, I said to myself, I cannot be that good. I just don't think I can be, I was a piano player. I don't think I can get that good, and I stopped on the spot, and that was the end of my piano days. But I said, maybe the drawing thing will work out. Coming back to point, the studio's getting cheaper, studio's getting smaller. The business of the studios is complete freefall, which, in, but another word for that is democratic. It's, it's like cowboy time out there. There are no rules. This is good. If you're afraid of it, then that means you don't understand it. So who would be afraid of it? Well, the people who would be afraid of it would be the six guys that controlled it for 30 years. I don't want to get into that story. Uh, maybe it's 16 instead of six. They're terrified of it. So when the downloads started, 
everybody, what was the first reaction by the big, by the big majors? We better control it. We better stop it. And the kids said no. Well, they tried to stop it. They just, they, you couldn't stop it. And now finally they're embracing it. You know, it took a, it took a coffee company to shake everybody up. Yeah, who was the biggest seller of music two years ago? It was Starbucks. Three years ago, it was a computer geek, Steve Jobs. Finally, everybody recognized that we better just get on the bandwagon here. You don't need to have a record company anymore.